which we were really looking forward to, given that it is on COVID and you know this is a, a pandemic that has kind of touched all of us in many different ways. And it is therefore uh, the subject is very topical you know, for the day, and we are all looking forward to. We are all looking forward to. So, uh, yeah, we are all looking the, forward to. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, Professor Ram Ramaswamy will be uh, conducting the helping to conduct the lecture, but uh, I would uh, before we hand over to Professor Ramaswamy, I would uh, request our director, Professor Ram Gopal Rao, to uh, formally welcome you and uh, say a few words about uh, the institute and about this lecture, and then we'll move on to the actual uh, proceedings of the lecture today. So, by the way, this is also being uh, trans broadcast live on YouTube. On IIT Delhi's YouTube channel, and uh, you know many others are also joining us. So, in the next three or four minutes, we can get started formally. So, Professor Rao. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Roy. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Professor Shahid Jamil, for agreeing to give this talk. I think, as uh, we all know, Professor Jamil is a very well-known uh, virologist in the country. He is known for his research, and he is also uh, helping Government of India. To deal with this crisis through various committees and all that, I know I knew that he was on some of the national committees, and uh, uh, I think even at IIT Delhi, the pandemic has been uh, you know pretty devastating. We lost uh, some of our very well-known colleagues during the first wave. I thought we we did well, but the second wave uh, you know was not the same for us. So it has been a struggle since then. And uh, a lot of uh, mental health issues, which are also things we are dealing with now because of the pandemic. So I think we would like to hear from you. The, the talk title is very apt and very appropriate. Everybody is uh, uh, trying to see what the future holds for us now, as far as the pandemic is concerned. IIT Delhi also has uh, uh, contributed in multiple ways uh, uh, in terms of science and technology on the detection thing. One thing which our faculty did from the Kusuma School of Biological Sciences is uh, the very low cost uh, RT-PCR kit, the probe free kit. And we launched it at uh, 399 rupees while uh, at that time the RT-PCR test costs were 4,500 rupees. I think in a way uh, we, we licensed the technology to uh, 10 companies and many of them uh, took that to the market. But I think in some way the RTPCR kit uh, cost today, if they are low, I think some of these developments have definitely helped in that direction. Also on the on the mass side, the PPEs, our Department of Textile Engineering, Textile and Fiber Engineering has done a tremendous job. In fact, there are over 7 million masks from IIT Delhi startups now based on the technology developed in the Department of Textile and Fiber Engineering. And many of them were again uh, certified mass uh, equivalent to N95 and uh, costing uh, 40 rupees kind of a thing, and which are also washable. So I think a lot of those developments have taken place. And even on the treatment side, many in our uh, bio school, DBEB, KSBS, and other schools, they uh, looked at uh, the Indian uh, traditional medicines like uh, uh, ashwagandha and others and scientifically validated their effectiveness for fighting the virus so a lot of good research has taken place and uh, i think you know in a way it has helped the country uh, to some extent and uh, i think uh, we're all keen to hear from you professor jamil thanks for taking time uh, i know how busy you must be with uh, so many people asking you to give a talk and uh, or even wanting to consult you. So thanks for taking time to be with us. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Ramaswamy, over to you. Uh, for the lecture. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, let me add my words of welcome uh, to uh, everybody who is tuning in, either on our own uh, channel here at the IIT or on YouTube. Uh, uh, well, uh, Professor Shahid Jamil, a uh, speaker of today, is one of India's leading virologists. He's also the director of the Trivedi School of Biosciences at Ashoka University. Uh, Shahid started as a student of chemistry at the Aligarh Muslim University 
and then the IIT Kanpur, following which he obtained the PhD in biochemistry at Washington State University and did postdoctoral work in virology at the University of Colorado Health Sciences in, Den in Denver. For uh, 25 years, he set up and led the virology group at the ICGEB, and uh, in that sense was a neighbor uh, of not just of mine at uh, JMU, but also of the IIT in some sense, uh, just down the road from us. And uh, in during this 25 year period, uh, he did spectacular work uh, for which he was awarded the Shanti Swaru Bhatnaga Prize in Medical Sciences. He worked on human viruses and he was elected to the various science academies of India. He was also a Rockefeller Foundation Biotechnology Career Fellow and a Wellcome Trust International Senior Research Fellow. His research at ICGEB was on human viruses. Hepatitis E, HIV, AIDS, and SARS. And he focused on virology, immunology, pathogenesis, and contributed to vaccine development. Uh, subsequent to his career at the ICGEB, he moved to the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance. For seven years, he, led, uh, he was their CEO, uh, and he led this biomedical research charity uh, towards a path of excellence in research management, public engagement, and science communication. So as you can see, uh, he brings a unique combination of excellence in science, particularly in virology, uh, knowledge, a deep knowledge of SARS, and uh, therefore of this family of coronaviruses. And we are really very privileged that he has agreed to speak to us today on COVID-19 in India, the past, present, and the future. The format of this lecture would be, a, it will be a sort of the usual lecture, but uh, we will, uh, or he has kindly agreed to take questions uh, in between. So at certain points, uh, if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box. And uh, I'm requesting Professor Pritha Chandra also to help me to uh, identify the questions so that we can pose them to uh, Shahid during the course of the talk. Uh, thank you very much, Shahid, for speaking to us. Please share your screen and start. Thank you very much, Ram, uh, for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Professor Ram Gopal Rao, uh, Shantanu, and everyone else for the invitation. Um, so what I will plan to do is then I'll break my talk into two parts. The first part I will cover uh, the aspects of the pandemic in the country uh, related to the world and talk about the genomic variants of the virus. We'll stop after that, uh, take a few questions and then move on to vaccines. So if you have a question about vaccines, hold off because uh, I know that when we talk about genetic variants, uh, people will have questions whether this variant will work with that vaccine or not. Uh, so hold off on those and we'll, we'll take that towards the end. Okay, so let me share my screen and get started. Yeah. All right. Uh, Sorry. Okay, ready to go. So, uh, if you look at the pandemic uh, today, uh, there are over 178 million confirmed cases in the world, uh, roughly 2.3.9 uh, million deaths. Uh, and the other startling thing is that by now, the world has delivered 2.6 billion doses of vaccines. Remember, this pandemic is only about a year and a half old, less than that. It has never happened in the history of uh, disease, infectious disease, that uh, a pandemic has been broken by a vaccine. And we are on our way to break this pandemic with a vaccine. No matter what you see today, uh, a lot of details, in the end, vaccines will conquer 
this pandemic. Uh, the news has not been very happy for India because we are the number two in the world uh, as far as uh, cases are concerned. Roughly 30 million cases, confirmed cases have happened in India. Uh, we don't have a really good estimate of how many actual cases. If you move to the right and uh, look at the graphs, uh, the red one shows you daily cases, uh, and this is world over. And you will see that the pandemic has really, you know, started off slow, then picked up speed. We had one peak, went down, and in the start of 2021, another peak has come. This has largely been driven by viral variants, as you will see when we go along. The uh, white graph shows you deaths, uh, and again, uh, deaths have not abated. I mean, they have gone down a little bit but uh, follow the daily cases. But again, the hopeful sign is the green line here, which shows how quickly vaccination picked up, uh, especially in this new year, 2021. And uh, we are on our way to vaccinating the world. Uh, the, the trouble, however, has been that uh, these vaccine doses are not equally distributed around the world. So there is a question of uh, access and equity, and hopefully in time that will be solved as well. So on this moving chart, I am situating India uh, in, with the world. Uh, and you will see that we started off slow uh, while other countries were peaking out. And then, you know, around mid-September last year, our first wave peaked out. And then we kept going down for the next five months or so. And we kept going down and down. There was a little blip between the Sahara and Diwali, but never took hold. And then this went all the way down to about February, mid-February, and then our second wave started. And this peaked out, this beat everyone out. Our second peak was about twice the size, uh, about four times the size of our first peak. It rose sharply, and now, as we see, it is falling sharp. So that's how uh, the pandemic has worked out. And on top, you'll see the total number of cases, deaths, and the new cases over yesterday. Uh, it has come down to roughly 40,000 cases, uh, and deaths have, for the first time in this wave, gone below 1,000. So all those are good signs that the second wave is under control. But what does the future hold for us? We'll look at that. All right. <clears throat> so if you look at the graph of India today, uh, the thing that you notice is that most of the cases are now located in Western, Southern, and Northeastern India. The cent you know, Central India and Northern India, uh, the pandemic, second wave is pretty much over. But in many other locations, especially in, in southern India and in northeast, uh, we still have a situation which is not under control. And uh, the lines here show you, for example, test positive ratio. Test, test positive ratio simply means is out of the 100 people, if you test, how many come out positive. And you will see that the top TPRs come in the northeastern uh, states and then uh, in the southern states. So this qualifies what I've been saying that the pandemic has moved uh, to southern India and uh, parts of the northeast. And the same thing is happening to the daily growth rate while the growth of the epidemic in India has fallen to about 0.2% per day. Uh, there are many states that are still above the national average, and especially the uh, uh, the states in, in Northeast. And the, the yellow lines show you the vaccination rates, what percent uh, people have uh, at least one dose. And again, you will see that, uh, you know, all states are not equal. Some states have given more vaccine than others. Okay. 
So as far as vaccinations are concerned, uh, I showed you earlier how we've crossed the 2 billion mark. Uh, China has really led in terms of vaccinations. Over 1 billion doses have been delivered uh, in China. Uh, the US has given a little over 300 million doses. And India follows actually very close behind. Almost 290 million doses of vaccine have been given in India. Uh, and this is really no mean achievement, uh, but like everything else, population drags us down. So the, uh, the percent of people who have been vaccinated in India is with at least one dose is still below 20%. And it is this number that we really need to get up. But what happened yesterday was a very important policy shift. Uh, India is now going to have provide free vaccines to everyone. The center is going to buy vaccines. States will not have to buy vaccines and it will be available free. This is a very, very useful and very good policy shift. And as if to celebrate that for the first time yesterday, India gave more than 8 million doses of vaccine. Uh, so far in this, since we started vaccinating in January, at best, we have gone to about 4 million uh, doses. For the first time yesterday, we did 8 million. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't carry off today. Uh, we went back down to about 3.5 or 4 million. I have not looked at the exact count. But one hopes that as time goes, uh, we will have more vaccines and we will be able to deliver vaccines at that capacity of roughly 8 to 10 million doses uh, a day, uh, because only at that rate we are going to cover the population that needs to be covered during the rest of this year. Okay, uh, so let me shift from here to uh, what I am most comfortable with, and that's the biology and the genomic diversity of, of this virus. So by now, you know that the virus we're talking about belongs to a family of viruses, which is called coronaviruses. Uh, and this family of viruses is characterized by having the largest RNA genome among all RNA viruses. Most RNA viruses have a genome size of roughly 10 kilobase. Coronaviruses have 30 kilobase genome. And as a result of a genome that big, it also codes proteins like exonuclease, which have a proofreading function, which means that errors that are created during replication can be corrected to some extent. And as a result of that, the mutation rate of this virus is much less than uh, all other RNA viruses. But coming back to this virus, there is often uh, questions uh, as to where this virus really came from. Uh, and I'm sure that's on many people's mind, whether it really came from a bat or uh, it came from a lab. And there is a there uh, is a very hard debate going on right now. I don't plan to address that uh, in the main talk, but if we have questions, I'll be happy to address them. So for the present virus, the uh, highest nucleotide identity is to bat viruses that were isolated in eastern China uh, in 2013. Uh, and more recently, people have found uh, another bat virus which has more than 96% identity to the SARS coronavirus. Uh, another animal coronavirus, a pangolin coronavirus, has high identity. But if you look at the identity to the first SARS virus, that's about 80%. The MERS virus, which caused uh, and then, which caused outbreaks in, in the Middle East and which came from bats into camels and from camels into humans shows about 55%. And there are four other common cold coronaviruses that have now become endemic in our population and they have roughly 50% identity. So that's the status of this virus at this point. The viral genome uh, is made up of non-structural proteins shown here in brown and structural and regulatory proteins shown here in blue. 
The protein of biggest interest to us is the S protein or the spike protein, because this is the protein that the virus uses to get into cells. And all our vaccines are made using this protein. So all vaccines are directed against this protein. So here is an illustration of what the virus possibly looks like. Uh, it is covered on the surface by uh, spikes. Each spike is a trimer made up of three monomeric units of the spike protein. Uh, shown in more detail here, the three spikes come together and form this uh, structure. And, and this structure has points on it through which the virus attaches to the cell, and uh, many of these points are also intercepted by neutralizing antibodies. So the virus enters cells by binding to a receptor on the surface of cells, which is called the ACE2 receptor. Uh, and the spike protein binds to ACE2. Following this binding, there's a conformational change in the protein the spike is digested into two parts, S1 and S2, and the S1 part remains bound to the receptor, whereas the S2 part induces fusion of the virus to the cell membrane. And that's how the virus gets into cells. So obviously, if you're able to prevent binding of the spike to the S2 receptor by using antibodies or by using small molecules, uh, you should be able to block virus entry into cells. And that is the fundamental principle behind vaccination for uh, COVID. Now, looking at genomic diversity, uh, what I show here on a linear scale is the viral genome, uh, the non-structural bits and the structural bits. And you will notice that the highest density of mutations are seen in the spike protein. Uh, the height of the uh, bar is the level of diversity, uh, and you will see most of the mutations are, are concentrated in the spike region. There are other proteins also that show mutations, uh, but uh, spike is, is the one that has most dense mutations. The evolution rate of the virus has been determined based of, and this is in general for coronaviruses, it's not for SARS-CoV-2, about 10 to the minus three per, you know, per nucleotide per year, uh, which essentially translates into roughly two to three nucleotides per month. So, which means that the virus on an average changes one nucleotide every two weeks. But then you may ask, why are we seeing so many variants? Why are we seeing these, uh, you know, high lines uh, on, on, on this diversity map? The reason simply is that we now have over 178 million confirmed cases. So the virus has spread very effectively. And because it has spread so effectively and it is, it is infecting so well, the transmission is high, the rate of mutation is also very high. Uh, although individual viruses don't mutate very much, but there is so much virus that uh, at the population level, we find a lot of variation. And this is seen in phylogenetic maps of the virus. So let me walk you through the top uh, left figure. As the virus came out of China, in 2019, uh, this virus, which, which started circulating, had a very important mutation early in January 2020. And that mutation was called a D614G mutation, which gave rise to a completely new clade of the virus. Uh, and as you will see that this tree diverged very significantly, and now most of the virus that is circulating in the world, all these colors you see uh, are viruses that have descended from the D614G virus. Uh, so that happened very quickly. 
And that happened because this mutation allows the virus to transmit and infect much better than the parental virus that came out of China. And by now, uh, multiple clades of the virus have accumulated. And what I show on this uh, graph over here are the variants of concern now. So the light blue that you see here is the alpha variant of concern, which was also called the UK variant. The dark blue here is the beta variant or South African variant. Uh, the blue one, uh, sorry, the green one here is the Brazil variant or the gamma variant. And uh, the green one down here is, uh, is the uh, Indian variant or the Delta variant. Uh, the virus continues to, continues to mutate, continues to diversify. And it, the same thing is presented on a radial graph here. So the idea is that anything close to the close to the periphery is a more recent emergence. Anything close to the center is uh, a more ancestral virus. And if you look at the prevalence of different variants uh, in the world now, you see that the alpha variant has spread well, but now the Delta variant shown in green here is also spreading quite effectively around the world. Now the naming has become fairly confusing. Uh, they, so, you know, when the virus first came, clades were defined by the year in which it came. And so it was 19A, 19B, then 20A, 20B, and it has now gone to H or something. But then these lineages, people started putting them in lineages and there were numbers like B117, uh, B1351. Uh, and that became very confusing. So uh, earlier this, this month, uh, WHO came together and said that they're going to assign Greek alphabets to variants that are important. So now we have these variants of concern, which is alpha, beta, gamma, delta, in order which they appeared. So the first one was the UK variant, the South African variant, the Brazil variant, and then the Indian variant. And there are several variants of interest, again, assigned, uh, assigned Greek uh, letters. And here are some of the key mutations. <clears throat> that have allowed the virus that are present in different variants at different levels, and these have allowed the virus to spread. This is the 614, uh, which emerged in January 2020. Uh, the N501 emerged first in the UK variant. The E484K, or the EEC mutant, uh, first emerged in, in the South African and the Brazil variant. The K417 is found in several lineages. Uh, the L452 uh, came up in California in a big way, and now it is part of the Delta variant. Uh, and there are several other, other mutations that we'll talk about as we go along. All right, so what's the difference between a variant of concern and a variant of interest? So a variant of interest, uh, is more contagious than its parental virus. It is more difficult to detect. And it occurs, you know, it, it has uh, clusters of outbreaks. But then, you know, something becomes a variant of concern if it has those three properties, but then adds a few other properties, such as vaccines may be less effective, some treatments may be less effective, spreads better from person to person. Uh, if there is evidence that the variant causes disease that is, is more severe or more prolonged. Uh, and of course, all this is, is decided by the World Health Organization, and they are the ones that give the, the scores. Uh, so far, there is no variant of high concern uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the world. Uh, but 
if the virus starts failing diagnostic tests, uh, if vaccines become significantly less effective uh, or treatment becomes significantly less eff effective, then that variant acquires the status of a variant of high concern. So at this point, we only have four variants of concern and several variants of interest that are floating around in the world. So here is a map of the four variants of concern. Uh, and the way you read these maps is the darker the color, more community transmission is happening of that variant in that particular country. So the alpha variant, which started from UK, is now showing community spread in North America. It's showing community spread in India and in Australia. The South African variant, of course, started from South Africa, but it's showing a lot of community spread in Western Europe, in Canada. The Brazil variant or the gamma variant, of course, in Brazil, but also North America. And the Delta variant, which start, which was first detected in India, has now spread to parts of Western Europe, Australia, and uh, all of North America, essentially. So uh, various variants of concern are spreading at various rates, at various frequencies in different parts of the world. Uh, let me look at the virus that was first detected in India, the B1617 lineage. Uh, and this virus, when it appeared, it was characterized by two key mutations, the L452R mutation and the E484Q mutation. Uh, and of course, this D614G is present in every virus that's circulating. But soon in India, this virus started diversifying into three sublineages. So you will notice that in 617.1, L452R is present, but uh, yeah, the L452R is present uh, in this, in the dot two, and to a lesser degree in the dot three sublineage. The e 484 q mutation is present in dot one lineage, but completely absent from the dot two lineage. But the dot two lineage has acquired another mutation, which is the T478K mutation, which is completely missing from the dot one and the dot three lineages. So the point is that there was a lineage that emerged but very quickly started diversifying into multiple sublineages. And the virus that now circulates most is this dot two lineage, which is also called the Delta variant of concern. The dot one and dot three are still variants of interest. They're not variants of concern. And here is a, here is a top view of the spike trimer to show you the regions that bind to the receptor. Uh, so essentially the light colored region here is the receptor binding domain and the red region is the receptor binding motif that directly contacts the receptor. And in yellow are marked these mutations, the L452, the E484 uh, mutations and the uh, the T478K mutation is also very close to this region. So the point is that all of these viruses uh, have these mutations like 452, which allow more tight binding to the receptor. E484 allows the virus to escape some antibody responses, and so does the T478K. Now, uh, when we were sequencing uh, the viruses from India, some of you may recall that there was a news report uh, about many doctors in Gangaram Hospital and many doctors in Ames coming down with uh, infection, even though they had received two doses of the vaccine. 
So uh, we investigated this very quickly uh, as part of INSACOG, which was the consortium of sequencing labs. And we very quickly found out that uh, all these vaccine breakthroughs that happened, happened because of this T478K mutation. By that time, the dot two link sublineage had not yet been identified and characterized as a sublineage. So that essentially showed you the, the sort of value of sequencing uh, that you can very quickly find out what is causing breakthrough in the population. So in, in a way that was also, uh, uh, that also shows that uh, the dot two virus has the capacity to cause breakthrough infections in people who are vaccinated. Uh, but uh, thankfully, it is still not causing infection uh, of a type that will put people in hospital. Out of 58 people in Gangaram hospital, only five had to be hospitalized, out of which only one was in the ICU. And the person who was in the ICU uh, was more than 75 years of age. So it, it illustrates two things. One is that mutations will escape the immune vaccine derived immune response but the second and more hopeful uh, thing is that uh, vaccine induced responses will still control severe disease and mortality in india that's the picture right now if you go from the very beginning till now and just concentrate at the end here the B6, B1617 viruses are now dominant in the country. And uh, this again is, are the mutations, uh, the density of mutations that you see in genomes that have been sequenced from India. Uh, and this represents roughly 450 genomes. Okay, but this is far more dramatic. Uh, if you start looking at what has been happening in the country, since January this year, and for every ten for every ten days, the distribution of different variants of concern and variants of interest have been plotted here. So what you immediately see is that Delta variant, which is here, the six one seven dot two variant, how dominant it has become uh, in you know by by May twenty twenty one. And this is the situation in January 2021. So within a few months, this dark red line over here has really captured the, uh, you know, the, the variant space in the country. And this, we believe, is the reason for the second wave. The second wave, if you recall, came around, started around March and then uh, really picked up speed in April and peaked out in May. And that is exactly what this, uh, you know, the, the, the pattern that this variant is following, that it has completely overtaken uh, everything else that was circulating in the population. Now, uh, as if things were not bad enough, uh, we now have something that is called the Delta Plus variant. That's a new lineage that is emerging. What is the Delta Plus lineage? So simply put, the Delta Plus lineage is one additional mutation in the Delta background. And that mutation is this one right here. N417 uh, is, is the mutation. Now, if you, if you do the same kind of plot for the Delta variant, the AY variant, the Delta plus variant, compared to the others, you will see that uh, the Delta plus variant has this K417N mutation. It is absent from Delta. It is absent from Alpha. This is a mutation that was found in the Beta variant. So essentially what has happened is, a key mutation from the beta variant has now appeared in the delta variant. 
and that is what we call the delta plus variant. Uh, missing one slide possibly. Anyway, uh, so essentially now what is, as delta plus is emerging, even delta plus is diversifying into two sublineages. It's called AY.1 and AY.2, uh, and they are circulating differently in different geographic regions. Uh, just one other thing about these variants, and that is their transmissibility. So if this was the original SARS virus that came out of China, the alpha variant which emerged was about 50% more transmissible, and so was the beta variant. The gamma variant was about 100% more, uh, more transmissible. But now you have the delta variant that's roughly 250 times, uh, 250, uh, sorry, 2.5 times more transmissible than the original virus. So if the original virus had a R0 or the transmissibility factor of 2 or 2.5, you can imagine that the Delta variant now has a transmissibility factor of about 5. What it essentially means is that if people infected with the original virus were each infected person was on average infecting two others, the anyone infected with the Delta variant is now on an average infecting five persons. And remember, this is exponential. Uh, so, you know, one infects five, five infect 25, and that's how it, it goes. And that's precisely the reason why we saw such a huge second wave. And the other thing you may have noticed in the second wave is that whole families came down with the infection, whereas in the first wave, possibly only one person in the family came down, isolated themselves, and they were, uh, and the rest were protected. So the virus has changed, and with this change, its ability to transmit has changed. So what I plan to do is stop at this point before I talk about vaccines, uh, yeah. and take questions if you have uh, any questions. Uh, Shahid, uh, one quick question uh, between Delta and Delta Plus, right? Which uh, you know, your the new one, uh, is there a difference in the transmissibility? We don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, uh, those you know, transmissibility can only be detected at the population level, and this virus hasn't been long enough uh, for us to know that. There are only about 200 sequences known right now, so it's not possible to calculate the transmissibility. It is unlikely to be any less transmissible. It is possible that it's slightly more transmissible because this one mutation allows the virus to bind a little better to the receptor. Hmm. Are we sequencing enough? Um, the testing concerns were addressed, uh, and now we do seem to be testing quite a bit. But uh, I was a little surprised to see only about 3,500 uh, sequences have been collected in India so far. No, no, From actually, that was just a small representation. India uh -huh. by now has almost 30,000 sequences. Done. Okay, okay. Is that a good number for our population? Well, that's 0.1% of cases. Uh, so it's still below what WHO suggests. WHO suggests that you do 0.3% of your cases. But then, you know, when you, when you start having 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 cases per day, mm -hmm. uh, it becomes very difficult to keep up the pace. Uh, and, you know, our entire sequencing capacity of the 10 labs put together is roughly 30,000 per month, 30,000 uh, sequence per month. Uh, so sequencing 
sort of infrastructure needs to be upgraded. Uh, and that's one lesson we have learned. But even then, I, I believe this consortium has sequenced quite well and have found very useful things which mm -hmm. can warn the public health system in the country uh, of what steps need to be taken. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, let me just open up the uh, Q and A. Are there any questions? Uh, please put them on the chat link. Uh, Pritha, uh, I don't see any questions so far. Uh, just one minute. Yeah, okay. Why don't you carry on then? Oh, uh, sorry, there is a question from uh, Mausam. Do we know something about conditional transmissibility? Uh, namely, is the Delta, what is the transmissibility of Delta given that they were already infected by either Alpha or Beta or any of the others? I am afraid I don't understand the question. I mean, supposing a person was infected by the first in the first wave mm -hmm. by alpha mm -hmm. and uh, will, uh, are they more likely or less likely to get uh, the, in this you know to get infected in the second wave i think that's what you mean uh, well uh, i think somebody who got uh, got infected in the first wave would have been protected from disease, it is possible that a lot of people got asymptomatic infection and therefore they were never, uh, yeah, I mean, there were very few cases of symptomatic infection in the first wave and another mm -hmm. symptomatic infection in the second wave. Okay, I see. Okay, that's interesting. Um, there's another question. Uh, uh, is there so much variability in the ACE2 receptor to allow this kind of uh, variability in the binding? Well, uh, I mean, the human ACE2 receptor binds with, you know, these surfaces uh, at different, with different affinities, essentially. Hmm. Uh, but the point is that if there is a mutation that allows the virus to bind just a little better, uh, then uh, you know it, it it allows the virus to enter better. It allows the virus to replicate better and and transmit mm -hmm. better. Uh, so to answer your question, I I don't think it's the ACE2 receptor has that kind of variability, mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, the virus is actually trying to optimize its binding to the ACE2 receptor. Uh, and that's why we see so much variation happening now. Okay. okay. And then one last question before we uh, ask you to talk, tell us about vaccines. Uh, <clears throat> there's a question about asking about the recurrence. You know, if it has recurred once uh, to the second wave, uh, it's likely to recur again. Um, and is there any kind of, you know, keeping in uh, in mind the history of pandemics and the history of epidemics, uh, is the subsequent uh, recurrence likely to be more or less? Uh, so essentially talking about the third wave. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Without yeah. calling it the third wave. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, India in June 2021 is very different from India in January 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the simple reason is that we had such a huge second wave that we have many more exposed people now. And all those exposed people would have some level of protection. Uh, so I don't believe that we're going to have a third wave which is going to be as severe. Mm -hmm. uh, but then let me also qualify that by saying that the third wave will depend on three things. One is uh, how quickly we vaccinate people now. The second is whether people follow 
COVID appropriate behavior, which will, you know, you know, masks and avoiding crowds will reduce transmission. And the third is going to be whether more infectious and more uh, immunity evading variants develop or not. Mm -hmm. So okay. the, the jury is still out uh, whether it will we could whether it will be really a wave or it will be like you know outbreaks of different intensity in different parts of the country. Mm. Uh, it remains to be seen, but I think it's a it's a time to be really cautious. Yeah, everything is opening up, and you know we need to be very very cautious. Okay, so let let's move on to the second part of your uh, presentation then. Uh... Okay, uh, so let me talk about vaccines then. Now that you know all about variants, let's talk vaccines. Okay, so vaccine, as as all of you know, uh, is is simply a biological preparation that provides active immunity. Uh, it is it is something that looks like the pathogen, but it is not the pathogen. Uh, but it 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 stimulates our immune system to recognize the pathogen at a future time when uh, we may get infected. And of course, this is a uh, this is the historic photograph of uh, Edward Jenner, uh, you know, inoculating the small boy with cowpox to protect him against smallpox. And that's really the start of uh, vaccination. And the date for this is, I believe, 1796, so late 18th century. So the way immunity works is if we have been vaccinated earlier for something, and, and, you know, I, as children, we get all kinds of vaccines. We get measles, chickenpox, uh, you know, flu, we don't really get as children. I don't get the vaccine, but, you know, many, many vaccines. Uh, those vaccines will raise antibodies. They'll also raise immune memory. Uh, and that will protect us against these pathogens. But when a new pathogen enters us, there is no pre-existing immunity to that pathogen. And that's why this pathogen takes hold and starts causing infection. Now, in most cases, the, you know, we are, our immune system is able to control it. Uh, and that's what you've seen in the case of COVID as well, that, uh, you know, uh, roughly 80% people have asymptomatic infection, only about 15 to 20 percent people show symptoms. Out of that, a small fraction show disease that is bad enough to be hospitalized. And in this case, somewhere between one to two percent uh, people with a confirmed infection uh, have died. But you know, a majority of the people are able to control the infection, uh, even to a new pathogen because our body has the ability to raise these immune responses. Uh, so that's one way of raising immune response, get infected and raise an immune response for the future. But that can turn out to be fairly costly if the pathogen starts killing at only one or 2%. Uh, and you know, if you'll recall that Sweden tried this to achieve herd immunity through infection, and it was a disaster. They had one of the highest death rates in the world. Uh, so what's the other alternative? The other alternative is to vaccinate, to raise uh, immune memory and to raise immune uh, to raise immunity through vaccines. So typically a vaccine is either a part of the pathogen or even the whole pathogen which has been killed. Uh, and this is used to prime the human body to raise an immune response. In this case, we're talking about the spike protein, which is a protein found on the surface of the virus to uh, give antibodies. And the value of vaccines should be uh, really evident to all of us. Vaccines have really been uh, the most cost-effective 
tool for public health and they have the one of the best returns of on investment of of any public health measure and so it's it is estimated that for every dollar that is spent on vaccines it brings back uh, another 44 45 dollars in terms of children who grow up to be healthy adults uh, and if you look at this this complex drawing it's actually not that complex uh, every row represents one disease and the columns represent decades uh, so you will see that there was a lot of measles in the world till about the mid 1960s when the va measles vaccine was introduced and after that the incidence of measles went down dramatically the same thing happened let's say to pertussis when the when the vaccines were first uh, introduced in the late 1940s the incidence went down very quickly polio is a great example after uh, the polio vaccine was introduced in 1955 polio essentially disappeared from much of the world and now uh, the, the world is polio free except for two countries uh, so we have eliminated this pathogen by vaccines and same is the case for smallpox smallpox has been eradicated because of uh, vaccines so vaccines work uh, and and historically this is really the first time that we're trying to control a pandemic uh, through a vaccine and that's simply because we now have the technology available to produce vaccines uh, within a year less than a year and this is something uh, which is a very positive outcome of COVID. You have often heard this term called herd immunity so let me just take half a minute to explain what herd immunity is. Let's say you have a room full of susceptible people shown here in blue and in that room you introduce one infected person the whole room will become full of infected people fairly quickly if nobody is protected against that pathogen now if you do the same in a room in which some people are protected others are not but this is below a certain threshold then again those who are protect those who uh, are protected will remain disease free whereas everyone else will will uh, you know get the get the infection however if your vaccination is above a certain threshold then even the blue ones who have no immunity will continue to be protected because of the herd effect the infection will not reach them. I'm giving you the example of a room, but essentially we're talking about clusters here. So the question is, what is that threshold? And that threshold varies for how quickly the virus is transmitted in a population. So if you talk about seasonal flu, for example, seasonal flu has an R naught of about two to 2.5, and that requires rough, roughly 60 to 65 percent of people to be immunized to show a herd effect. If you're talking about measles, which has a R naught of 18, 1, 8, then you require 99 percent of people to be vaccinated before that 1 percent will be protected. As we have seen COVID, it started out with a virus that had an R naught of about two to 2.5. So everyone was saying, you know, maybe 60% vaccination should be fine. Now it has become a virus with an R naught of roughly four to five, the Delta variant. So the threshold has increased and the threshold has gone to somewhere around 80 to 85%. So remember that is our target for the moment. We have to vaccinate 80% of India's population to achieve herd immunity in the country and hopefully this transmissibility will not change in future okay so what are the types of vaccines we are using <clears throat> well 
Well, the, the, the very first type of vaccine and the most common vaccines uh, available uh, for all kinds of infections are either whole virus killed vaccines or attenuated vaccines. The example of whole virus killed vaccines is the injectable polio vaccine. Uh, the live attenuated vaccine is the oral polio vaccine. In today's context for COVID, we don't yet have any approved live attenuated vaccine, but we do have several inactivated vaccines, including the Bharat Biotech vaccine that we call Covaxin. Uh, the biggest surprise of this pandemic has been the rise of genetic vaccines and especially RNA vaccines. And the idea here is very simple. You take a piece of RNA that can go into cells and produce the spike protein or a part of the spike protein and that gives immunity. This is something that people had been working on for about a decade in, uh, in the context of cancer vaccines. And uh, this showed surprisingly good results for COVID. So as a result, we now have two leading vaccines, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, uh, which are RNA vaccines. The drawback of RNA is that it is very labile and therefore it has to be protected in a lipid nanoparticle. And the, the other drawback is that it has to be stored at very low temperatures, so cold chain has to be maintained. Another type of genetic vaccine is a DNA vaccine. Uh, there are none approved right now, but the Indian vaccine from Zydus Cadilla uh, has completed its phase three trial and it is with the regulator for approval. So hopefully India will uh, produce uh, the first approval for a DNA vaccine uh, sometime soon. Uh, and, and the idea of a DNA vaccine is also that just like RNA goes in, into cells and makes protein, the DNA will go into cells, produce RNA, and that RNA will make protein. Uh, the other popular vaccines are these viral vector vaccines. Uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine uses a chimpanzee adenovirus. An adenovirus is a virus that causes the common cold. The uh, gene for the spike protein is uh, uh, is carried by this viral vector, and when cells get infected by this viral vector, they produce the spike protein. So mostly adenovirus vectors have been used in Oxford AstraZeneca. We have the chimp adenovirus in the Sputnik vaccine, which has now been approved for India. We have the human adenovirus and two different serotypes, adenovirus 26 and adeno 5. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is also based on adenovirus uh, 26. Several other viral vectors are in use, but none of these have been approved yet. And the final type of vaccine are virus-like particle or soluble protein vaccines. The world has a lot of experience with these vaccines. Uh, the very first recombinant DNA derived vaccine, the hepatitis B vaccine came in the 1980s and that was a virus-like particle vaccine. Uh, in the present pandemic, uh, Novavax has produced a virus-like particle vaccine which, uh, has, uh, which has produced very good results in phase three uh, and is waiting for approval. And if this vaccine gets approved, uh, Serum Institute of India has a partnership with Novavax to produce roughly 1.5 billion doses of this vaccine right here in India. Okay, a summary as of a uh, few days back. Uh, there are eight approved vaccines, fully approved, eight uh, vaccines that are in limited use, and more than 100 vaccines that are in different phases of clinical testing in the world. And this is remarkable because, you know, the, the disease is just about one and a half years old, and we have so many vaccines that have come through and that are waiting to come through. These are the leading vaccines at this point, the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna mRNA vaccines, the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine, which we call Covishield, 
uh, and you know many other vaccines that have received uh, either full or limited use approval. Novavax is waiting to be approved, completed phase three. Bharat Biotech is another vaccine which we use in India by the name of Covaxin. Uh, so quite phenomenal for how how things have happened. Okay, so the key question is, would current vaccines work against variant viruses? So let's look at what the data shows. But first, let's spend just a minute on vaccine efficacy. Uh, you know, as neutralizing titers increase, the protective efficiency of a vaccine increases. And most vaccines give, most vaccines for COVID at this time, give very good neutralizing titers. So let's say this is the neutralizing titer given by a vaccine. This is going to drop a little bit. The titer will drop and so will the efficacy with age, with time and with comorbidity. So, if I get vaccinated now, after a year, I won't have the same level of antibodies. So to put it very simply, for somebody who is 65 will raise a certain level of antibodies, but somebody who is 20 will raise much better antibodies. So the age effect. And of course, if people have some significant comorbidity, then also they don't produce uh, you know, as as good antibodies as somebody who doesn't have comorbidities. Now, if new variants are introduced, let's say the Delta variant of concern, and laboratory tests have shown that this variant reduces neutralization by roughly five to six times. So if that happens, the efficacy also reduces. And then, of course, the same age effect and comorbidity effect and time effect will happen. So, uh, some of these variants of concern will reduce the uh, efficacy of a vaccine. But the point is that the, the you still make enough antibodies to be able to control the virus uh, and prevent serious disease. And that is essentially what every vaccine is promising. No COVID vaccine is promising that people won't get infected, but every vaccine is promising that it will protect against serious symptomatic disease. All right, let's look at real world data. So uh, this is data from Public Health England, and let's focus on the top table first. Uh, we are looking at vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic disease. Symptomatic disease means you have some symptoms and you test positive for the virus. If you look at the efficacy of one dose or two dose of the Pfizer vaccine, it gives roughly 50% uh, and 93% protection in one dose or two dose for the alpha variant. The same vaccine for the Delta variant, one dose offers only 33% protection. Two doses give you roughly 90% protection. Same vaccine, different variant. You look at the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, 51%, 66% in terms of for one dose and two dose. 33%, roughly 60% for the Delta variant. But here we are talking about symptomatic disease. You may have mild symptoms, but what we really want to understand is whether a vaccine will protect against severe disease and hospitalization. So the same thing, look at hospitalization. Pfizer one dose will protect 83%, two doses 95% against alpha variant. 76 and 88, uh, sorry, uh, 94, 96 against the Delta variant. The Oxford AstraZeneca or COVID Shield will protect one dose 76, two doses 86, 
against Delta variant, one dose 71, two doses 92. Now, the question is, why is this important? It is important because, as you realize, India has increased its schedule between the first dose and the second dose from six to eight weeks to 12 to 16 weeks. That has been done partly because we don't have enough supply coming through. But this figure really reassures that you still have about 70% protection against severe disease and hospitalization, even if you get one dose of the vaccine. The vaccine that is given in India the most. Let's look at a CMC Velour study closer to home. They looked at both one dose protection and two dose protection. They did not say whether it was Covishield or Covaxin, but since 90% people in India have been vaccinated with Covishield, we assume that most of this effect is because of Covishield. How many people developed infection? How many got hospitalized? How many needed oxygen in the hospital? How many needed ICU? And how many died? With a single dose, 95 protection against ICU, 94% against oxygen, 70% against hospitalization, 61% against infection. So again, the CMC Velour study is showing the same thing what the Public Health England study showed uh, in UK. Two doses, of course, give uh, better protection uh, on every parameter here. So the point again is that even if we get one dose, we get reasonably good protection, of course, not complete protection, but reasonable protection. So the strategy to increase the distance between the two doses uh, is really based on this real world analysis that we are seeing. Another study from India, but this was done in January and February when the alpha variant was circulating. Uh, the Delta had not become very prominent. Uh, and this, this looked at healthcare workers in PGI Chandigarh Hospital. Those who did not take the vaccine, those who took the vaccine. And the bottom line is that vaccine afforded roughly 80% protection in the uh, hospital care setting, in the healthcare work, among healthcare workers that are really exposed the most uh, in, in the outbreak. So again, showing that vaccines are working. The final example of a real world data comes from Apollo hospitals, and this is not published yet. Uh, 31,000 uh, people vaccinated, less than 5% got symptomatic disease, and there were no deaths in this group. So it's a fairly large study, Apollo hospitals all across the country, again in a healthcare setting, and you see how vaccines are giving protection in a real world setting. This is the real data. The problem is that most people worry about anecdotal evidence saying, you know, so-and-so took a vaccine and became infected. Well, you know, no vaccine is claiming you won't get infected or so-and-so took the vaccine and had to be hospitalized. Yes, it happens at a low level, but you know, at a population level, vaccines are protecting, and that is the bottom line. Okay, so uh, what do we know about the Delta variant and what do we don't know about the Delta variant? What we know is that it, it is spreading very rapidly around the world. So, uh, for example, in US, just two months back, uh, you know, this this variant was less than one percent. Today, it is twenty percent in in U in US. The same thing is happening in UK. India, I already showed you between January and and May how the Delta variant has expanded, and now this has become the most prevalent variant uh, in the country. It is more. It appears to be more transmissible. Uh, whatever calculations have been done show that it is. Uh, at least, uh, you know, 
twice or maybe two and a half times more transmissible than the original virus. Uh, it appears to be also associated with different symptoms. Uh, people, you know, China is reporting, for example, that it is causing more severe disease uh, than, uh, you know, the, the original virus. Uh, also, people with the Delta virus may be more likely to be hospitalized. Uh, these are unvaccinated people. So there is value in taking vaccines. Even if one dose is right now available to you, please go and take it because that will give you at least 60 to 70% protection against uh, the Delta variant. We know based on various studies that one dose is less effective, two doses will still protect, uh, but even one dose protects to some extent. What we don't know is whether Delta is associated with more deaths. Uh, those studies haven't really been done. And whether booster shots will be needed. Uh, we don't know that yet. So finally, uh, you know, in summary, uh, the, these are the different viruses. The D614G is the original virus, which we also call the B1 virus. It was transmissible to some extent, did not evade immunity. The alpha variant was much more transmissible, again did not evade immunity. The beta variant was not as transmissible, but evaded immunity big time. The gamma variant little more transmissible, little more immune evasion. And the gamma variant is the one that has caused all the troubles in Brazil. Let's come to the Delta variant, much more transmissible, significantly evades immunity. But the point remains that so far vaccines appear to be effective against all of these variants of concern, even though the vaccine efficacy may drop, but vaccines are still protecting people from severe disease. I think that's my last slide. Uh, uh, I'll quickly stop. Okay. Thank you, uh, Shahid. Let's just go on to the questions because there is a fair number. Um, there's, there's one from, uh, okay, to, there's some pertaining to the first part of, the, uh, of your talk. Uh, why and but why is the Delta variant having such a transmission? Uh, apart from the mutation that's allowing effective binding, is there a possibility of crosstalk between different signal cascades that's somehow allowing? You know, is there a genetic component there? Well, I, I, I'm not aware that those signaling studies have really been done with Delta. Uh, but there's another mutation in Delta, which is called the P681R mutation, which is very close to the cleavage site uh, when spike gets cleaved into S1 and S2. And that releases the fusion portion of the protein very nicely, uh, which allows the viral membrane and the cell membrane to fuse quite effectively. So it not just binds to the receptor better, but it also mm -hmm. allows the virus to enter better. Enter better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, about the vaccines, um, you know, uh, well, why has Covaxin not yet been approved, or is it just a question of time before the WHO goes ahead and uh, approves it? Yeah, so uh, WHO qualification requires the phase three data to be published. And for uh, vaccine makers to apply to WHO for qualification. For Covaxin, the phase three data is not yet published. And although talks are going on with WHO, uh, my information is that Bharat Biotech has possibly not officially applied for qualification. Mm -hmm. No, I thought some data had come out today uh, saying that, you know, phase three results of co-vaccine were out. But, uh, okay, I have not seen that. I have not I, seen that. Okay. Maybe it has. 
Uh, okay. Uh, there is a sort of a general question in many people's minds that if you had a choice, uh, I mean, I, you, you've been very firm and clear about it, take a vaccine, any vaccine. But if you had a choice, if there was a vaccine bar and you could go and order the one that you wanted, which one would you order? Oh, it depends, on which one, depends on which ones are available to me. So if I look at global data today, the mRNA vaccines are showing the best result. Okay. Uh, so somebody has actually done a comparison of different vaccines based on you know, various studies that have been published. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like a meta-analysis of all vaccine trials. Mm -hmm. Those vaccines, those, that meta-analysis shows that RNA vaccines give rise to the best antibody titers. The uh, Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine gives the best T-cell response. And both are, both are useful uh, in, in protection. Uh, so, you know, either of those vaccines, I think, would be a very good choice. Uh, both of those vaccines give antibodies as well as killer T cells. Mm -hmm. The one drawback of a killed virus vaccine is that while it will give antibodies, it does not give you killer T cells. So that's a drawback for a for an inactivated vaccine. Uh, so okay. okay, so yeah. it's a question of, but it's more important that you take a vaccine, any vaccine. Yeah, it's more important that you take a vaccine. In fact, what I've been telling people, uh, take the vaccine that is most easily available to you. Okay. I don't care which vaccine you take, just take a vaccine. Uh, is there a correlation between the age and the infectivity? Uh, you know, I mean, are children more susceptible to the Delta variant? There is no study like that. Uh, in fact, children are, are, are less susceptible uh, to the virus. Uh, and the, there is a biological reason for it. You know, the ACE2 receptor uh, increases in with age. So for, for children who are less than five years of age, they have very little ACE2 receptor on their cells. But as we grow older, the Density of this receptor increases in our cells. Okay. All right. But there are no studies for Delta and children. Yeah. I see. Um, how come our neighboring countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, etc., which also seem to have Delta variants, uh, they don't. Uh, it doesn't seem to have been as uh, you know, it's not been such a public health issue over there, or is that the data is not available? Well, there is always a question of how much uh, reporting is happening. Uh, but definitely what these countries did not see is the kind of, uh, you know, rush in hospitals that we saw uh, in the second wave. Hmm. Uh, I mean, two things are very difficult to hide. Uh, one is when people are flocking into hospitals. And the second is death. Yeah, uh, and we've not seen at least reports of those uh, from our neighboring countries. So I don't know. I can't answer that question. I, I, you know, it is strange. It is strange. Okay. Well, um, you know, actually, uh, Shahid, thank you very much for such a lucid presentation. There are, uh, you know, other questions are all related to the same things over and over again. Uh, but, you know, in the past hour and a half, you really have covered the whole gamut uh, of everything from the uh, from the virus. You've taught us a lot and also given a very a balanced uh, view of, uh, of of what to expect uh, on behalf of the entire IIT community. Let me uh, let me thank you. Uh, but let me, in case there is any burning question left, uh, you know, is if please just go ahead and put it in the chat box if you have one, and uh, otherwise we will.
I think uh, Professor Ramaswamy, there are a few more questions. Maybe Professor Preeta, would you like to ask them? I think you know one one question uh, I also have is is mixing of vaccines. Uh, yeah. You know, is it uh, anything interesting or important to do now? Yes. So, uh, in fact, uh, some uh, small trials have already been done. Uh, so, the one trial looked at the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, and whether you give Pfizer first and AstraZeneca second, or you reverse the order you get the same level of responses. Mixing gives you slightly better immune responses, but mixing also gives you more side effects. That was the outcome of that study. Mm -hmm. I believe India is also going to start uh, a trial on mixing vaccines. Uh, as far as immunology is concerned, there is no problem with mixing vaccines. Uh, in fact, for viral vector vaccines, it may be beneficial to mix because you know these adenoviruses that are being used to make these vaccines are very powerful antigens. So after taking two doses of an adenovirus, uh, if you take a third boost, you will not make any antibodies to the spike protein. Instead, you will continue to make antibodies to the adenovirus. Uh, so in that case, you know, mix, if boosters are required for all of us who have been vaccinated with COVID shield, we'll have to try another vaccine. We can't give a third dose of COVID shield, mm -hmm. and that's why it's it's important that uh, you know we we have other vaccines and we do you know sort of trials of mixing of vaccines before that time comes. Okay. So, Jamil, another interesting question is for the Apollo hospital study. What was the COVID positivity for the control group? COVID positivity for the control group. Uh, you mean control group healthcare workers who did not take the vaccine? Yeah, yeah. I I don't know that. See, this study hasn't been published. This is this was from Indian Express. Uh, so that's all I could get from uh, the newspaper. I don't know further details of this. Okay. Uh, what about Covaxin? Does, can one have three booster shots of Covaxin? Is that, uh, you know, you said that, that should not be a problem. Yeah, that should not be a problem. That should not be a problem. All right. Um, you know, because at the IIT, we've been largely having Covaxin rather than COVID shape. Um, okay, then some of these are the remaining questions on the Q&A that I can see are, um, uh, okay, so the one, one question which is there in everybody's mind is that, uh, is, it, is there any evidence of a lab leak? You know, the controversial question of whether uh, this yeah. is a natural or one, if you want to say some words about it, otherwise, no, no, I mean, I, you know, I think this is a question that will never be settled. 100 years from now, we will still be debating whether it was a lab leak or uh, it was a natural virus. And, you know, the, the, the reason simply is that unless China cooperates fully and opens up not just its freezers, but also its notebooks and computers, we will right. never know. And China is not going to do that. So we will never know. At this point, whatever scientific evidence is there, it points more towards natural origins of the virus. Okay. That's all I can say. All right. Good. I think that that's a good point on which to end today's talk. Um, and uh, so on behalf of our entire community at the IIT, on my personal behalf and on behalf of all of us, Thank you very much, Shahid, for a most illuminating and very informative lecture. And I think one which uh, in many ways was very reassuring as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Jamil. Thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks. you very much.
Okay, I think Professor Shahid Jamil has left. Um, Shantanu, 